part of this group that centered around doing outdoorsy activities like hiking, snowboarding, mountain climbing, and so on. It started as a Facebook group and evolved into a closer-knit group of people, around 10 of us. Not all 10 or so people go to every outing, obviously. We once organized a trip to Adirondack Park where we could climb one of the many mountain trails. On this trip, it was only four of us, DeVito, James, and Christina. We brought sleeping bags and two tents. Since James and I were the only guys on this trip, we carried the extra weight of the tents in our bags. Because we wanted to experience this during the beautiful fall foliage, we went in the month of October. The weather was perfect, but still, once it started getting dark, we couldn't continue on the path, and we'd have to set up camp before it would get too dark to do even that. We set up camp on a hard, rocky surface, and three of us started collecting wood for a little fire. James poured some lighter fluid into the pile of sticks and wood we collected, and that helped get it going. Sitting around the fire, we started to eat whatever foods we had packed while recounting about previous trips we'd taken together. That's when it first happened. A scream from the distance. A woman's scream. A scream that sounded as though someone was being attacked or feared for their lives echoed down the mountain. The four of us fell silent and looked at each other. Any of us who had food in our mouths had stopped chewing. We were all just frozen for a few seconds. The scream didn't repeat. We broke the silence by asking what we should do. We should have been alone this far into the trail. Then another sound echoed down the mountain. This one a loud popping sound. It didn't sound like a gunshot at all, but the best any of us could describe it was this high-pitched, loud, single popping sound. We now agreed to put the fire out and get in our tents. We didn't know who was out there or what was going on, and we didn't want to advertise our presence. I shared a tent with James while the girls shared the other tent. Falling asleep in a sleeping bag is always a tough task for me, and when you add hearing a blood-curdling scream out in the middle of nowhere not too far from you, it just makes it even harder. It was an hour or two that passed, and James seemed to have already fallen asleep. I was still rolling around from side to side, uncomfortable, when I heard another woman scream. This one was higher pitched and much, much closer. I sat up and looked at James, who was apparently woken up by the scream. We were scared to even leave the tent, because the scream was borderline right outside our campsite. We were discussing if we should wake the girls and pack it up and leave, but we'd have a long hike back in the dark ahead of us. We then heard footsteps outside our tent, the sound of shoes hitting the stone floor below us. I called both DeVito and Christina's names, expecting it to be them, but when they didn't answer and the footsteps stopped right outside the tent, I looked at James who looked back at me with an equally horrified look on his face. Someone then started shaking our tent violently, and James and I started to scream, and we could hear the girls screaming in their tent as well in reaction to our screams. I said on the count of three, we leave the tent and fight whoever was out there. I yelled my count to three, and on two, the shaking stopped. By three, I unzipped the door to the tent, and the two of us crawled out from it expecting to see someone standing out there, but they had already disappeared into the darkness, probably still watching us. We ran to the girl's tent yelling their names, saying we gotta go. They crawled out with their backpacks and followed us. We went back for our backpacks too after seeing them with theirs, even though our lives could have been in danger. After grabbing our bags and leaving the tents and sleeping bags, we somehow navigated down the mountain through the dark without flashlights on, relying only on moonlight. We had to stop and sit multiple times to rest, but we never stopped to sleep again. Not like we even had the option anymore. Plus, we were paranoid that we were being tailed. We had to just keep moving for hours until we made it back to the car. James drove us 20 minutes down the road before stopping, and then we slept in the car. We all woke up past noon because of how much walking we did and how late we finally got to fall asleep. We told the whole group about it the next day on the drive home. To our knowledge, nothing ever came up on the news about any kind of murders or weird happenings in the Adirondacks around that time. It was in October of 2017 if anyone wants to do some detective work of their own. This still holds up as the scariest and overall worst night of my life. My uncle is notorious in my family for being a daredevil and always worrying my mom, other uncles, and grandma, especially considering he's been on multiple medications for decades. He's what you'd call an adrenaline junkie. And he's climbed over five mountains in his life, most notably Everest. Well, he's attempted Everest, but he didn't make it to the top. Something in his living on edge personality and mentality slightly changed after he attempted to climb Everest. 
I was just 10 years old when he did, and even I remember the change. It wasn't until five years later that I was told just what happened on Everest. My uncle went alone on his expedition, which may have been his biggest mistake. He said he stayed at base camp for a full day before continuing his climb beyond that point. At first his climb was easy, he says, and as one would imagine, it got gradually more difficult. Even though it's a well-known fact that many bodies of previous climbers are still to be found on the mountain, my uncle says he never expected to actually find one. He entered the death zone, which is the area of the mountain where the high altitude results in a lack of available oxygen for humans to breathe. This is usually above 8,000 meters, and most of the 200 plus climbers who've died on Everest have died in the death zone. People are advised to not stay in the death zone for more than 16 to 20 hours. While in this zone, my uncle saw his first dead body lodged in a ravine, and being the happy, uppity, bubbly person he is, it was a shock and truly disturbing to him. He described his mood change from, in his words, feeling alive and on top of the world, to in over his head and mortal. Nevertheless, he progressed onward, and when he was tired, he took a break and sat down. Seeing the corpse really messed with his head, and he mentioned that he was also starting to feel dizzy and lightheaded, likely due to the high altitude. My uncle didn't want to get up from his position. He felt like he was losing energy and began talking to himself. My uncle finally got up from his seated position after an hour and decided he didn't have it in him to make it up to the top. He started to make his way down, until another climber bumped into him and started telling him to come on, let's go, passing him and climbing further up the mountain where my uncle just came from. My uncle told the man he was not up for it and was going to make his way back down to base camp. He recounts that as the man spoke back to him, urging him to continue up the mountain, his voice was very echoey and surreal. My uncle said take care to the man and continue back down the way he came with his head spinning and feeling short of breath. As he continued his way down, every time he'd look up, the man would be behind him, smiling and making hand motions for my uncle to come back up. He thought smiling and ignoring it would be the best way to get him to leave him alone. After continuously looking back to that man following him, my uncle finally stopped and started firmly telling the man he wasn't feeling well and just wanted to get back to base camp. The man slightly above my uncle smiled once more and said, watch me go over the ledge. Then he walked to the edge of the snow and leaped down, disappearing under the edge. My uncle said that as he saw this, it snapped him out of his daze and he ran over to the edge to look down it. But there was nobody to be seen sliding down the edge of the mountain, no marks in the snow. He didn't even hear the sound of him sliding down the snow initially or anything. Witnessing this made my uncle hurry down the mountain even faster, until the next thing he remembered was darkness, then waking up at the base camp medical clinic in a bed. He had passed out and a couple passerbys found him and carried him down low enough to where a rescue helicopter could reach him. My uncle waited until the end of the story to tell me that he was off his meds for the entire trip, and mixed with the lack of air in the death zone, he started to quickly hallucinate and talk to himself. Upon getting home, he did some research on recent deaths on the mountain and learned of a young man who had died climbing Everest that same week who looked just like the man in the hallucination. This is when he started to question if it was actually a hallucination or not. However, the death was reported before my uncle had this alleged hallucination. He still says he's not entirely sure what he saw was a hallucination. I don't press him for more details about this story as like I said, it's changed him and it's clearly left some kind of mental scar on him. I can't imagine how horrific of an experience this was for him. I once drove up to Banff National Park in Canada for a day of hiking and climbing. The park is home to numerous mountain climbing trails and is a scenic escape from the city for me to clear my head. I was going through a recent breakup and wanted to get out and get my mind off of it, and I thought this was the best way to do that. I had all my necessary tools in my climbing pack, including rope, a helmet, harness, quick draws, and whatever else I could fit in the bag. I hiked through half a mile of forest until I found a good rock wall I wanted to scale so I found a strong enough tree to use as my anchor point and wrapped some rope around it. You may be asking why I started from the top instead of the bottom. Well, normally if I were on a known route, there would be eye bolts that are anchored into the rock that I could have just clipped my carabiner to, and when the carabiner is attached, then I'd clip my rope. As I climb up, I would place another carabiner or anchor and so on. But since I was making my own route on this day, I had to anchor at the top of the climb, which is called top roping, and rappel myself down to set each bolt. At the end of all of this, I'll be at the bottom and able to climb up after setting my own route. After I was all set to go, I started to rappel down the face and set my bolts. 
to skip all the mountain climbing terminology and talk. As I rappelled down, I eventually came across a cave in the face. It was literally this big hole in the mountain wall, and it seemed unusual to me because usually a cave entrance is ground level. I was intrigued, so I climbed inside of it. I had plenty of rope to allow me to go inside. I was sitting at the edge of this opening, looking inside, and it got pitch black in there not too far from the entrance. I wondered how big this cave was, and if it led to a separate entrance on the other side of the mountain. But more importantly, I picked up on this buzzing sound from deeper in the cave. It was this very low, low note kind of buzzing, like you'd almost miss it if you weren't paying attention. I walked very slowly deeper into the cave, and as the humming got slightly louder, I said hello into the cave. Not because I was expecting an answer from anyone, nor did I want an answer. I wanted to see how much of an echo there would be, to give me an idea of how deep this cave went. And there was quite a loud echo. But on top of that, the humming or buzzing sound stopped after I said it. I was creeped out no doubt, but I was still intrigued as to what that buzzing sound could have been. I stepped just a little more into the cave, the rope starting to wedge at the top of the cave entrance now. I started to hear this slow, deep breathing, and I suddenly knew I wasn't in the cave alone. Perhaps there was an animal in there. I started to back away slowly out of the cave. When I felt I was close enough to the entrance of the cave, I took out my flashlight from my backpack, aimed it into the cave, and my finger quivered over the button for a few seconds. In a moment of poor judgment but pure curiosity, I turned the flashlight on and the cave lit up a bit. At first I thought it was just an empty cave, until I noticed the two heads peering to me from behind the curved cave wall. I could only see half their faces, but they looked sickly and decrepit. The way they were watching me, they were in the dark seconds ago, impossible for me to see, but them able to see me perfectly standing by the light near the entrance of the cave. I turned off the flashlight and ran for it back out of the cave. I started to climb back up the face, when I felt a grip around my ankle trying to pull me back into the cave. I kicked as hard as I could at my attacker, and I felt my shoe hit their face. In response, the sickly looking person let go. I heard him make this horrible shriek of pain. He sounded less human and more like some literal cave-dwelling monster. I didn't look down. I climbed the rock wall faster than I'd ever climbed. I don't think either of those two barely human things I saw in that cave attempted to come out and grab me. I made it back to the top in a surprisingly quick amount of time due to adrenaline. The reason I didn't just allow the rope to safely descend me down to the bottom instead of climbing to the top was because I feared they would grab the rope and pull me back up. I carved two big X's at the top of the face, and then two more at the bottom, indicating to whoever passes by here not to climb here. I hiked my way all the way back to the side of the road where I parked my car. I had a long drive home lost in my thoughts, appreciating my life and scared shitless, wondering what the hell was wrong with those people in that cave. Why were they in there, and what were they going to do to me? I'm telling you, they looked pale and sickly. They were not regular people. I called the park warden's number and gave them the coordinates of the cave and told them about the dangerous, sickly looking people hiding in there. I'll tell you one thing though, this experience definitely took my mind off my breakup for a while.